Hello. Thank you, everyone. It's a great pleasure, and I'm thrilled to be here today to talk a little bit about the research we are doing in my lab at UC Berkeley. And today, I want to talk with you about dopamine. Dopamine is a chemical molecule in the brain. It's released by nerve cells, which we call dopamine neurons, and it's released in many different functions, in many different brain areas. Initially, it has been discovered in 1957 by Arvid Carlson, and it has been thought to play a major role. Dopamine is a molecule in the brain important for communication between nerve cells. Initially discovered in 1957, it has been thought to play a major role for controlling movement. Later, it became the most prominent molecule uh, mediating pleasure and reward. However, despite being involved in so many different behavioral functions, scientists for a very long time have thought that dopamine cells are a pretty homogeneous cell population. Today, what I want to show you is that dopamine cells are actually very heterogeneous. They are involved in many different behavioral functions, and understanding this diversity can lead to novel therapeutic intervention. Before I delve deeper into dopamine, I want to talk a little bit about my background, what motivates me to study dopamine, and why I think it's so important to understand dopamine. What you see here is a photo of a pharmacy of my parents in northwestern Germany, in a very small town. I had a relatively unconventional path to science. I started my career as a pharmacist with the goal of taking over my family's business. But also, I was very interested in studying diseases. I was interested in understanding medicine. But what I realized when working as a pharmacist and interacting with many patients, including schizophrenia patients, it's not that straightforward. And there are a lot of limitations with the current medications which we give to our patients, which we give to our patients. Indeed, what you see here is a time cover from 1992 when clozapine was introduced to the market. Clozapine is a neuroleptic that we use to treat schizophrenia patients. Initially, there was a lot of hope about when clozapine was introduced that this may be a breakthrough treatment for schizophrenia patients, as you can see here from the cover. However, we learned that there are a lot of problems with uh, clozapine related, and it's, it's not this breakthrough treatment, even though it acts for positive and negative symptoms, there are a lot of problems with associated with. Indeed, when I was working as a pharmacist, a lot of schizophrenia patients told me about the problems with their drug, either being ineffective or a lot of side effects being involved. And indeed, when I was working as a pharmacist, this study came up showing that almost three quarters of all patients treated with neuroleptics, such as clozapine, they stop their treatment within 18 months, either because the treatments are ineffective or they have a significant amount of side effects. And this really led me to studying more the causes of these diseases. I started a PhD, I went into a postdoc, I started my own lab studying the dopamine system. Why did I study the dopamine system? because it's involved in so many different diseases, as you can see here. And an imbalance in dopamine levels in the brain can lead to many different diseases. And what we think is basically, if we understand the specific dopaminergic subsystems, we might have a more specific way, a more better way of finding specific treatments for all of these diseases. As you can see here, dopamine cells are located in two brain regions. One is the ventral tegmental area, VTA, and the other one is the substantia nigra. And dopamine is released in all of these different brain regions, as you can see here, amygdala, nucleus accumbens, cortex, and striatum. Currently, a lot of treatments for these diseases, they interact with the dopamine system, but they interact with all of these different subsystems of the dopamine system. So what we think, if we can figure out specific targets to only dopamine cells, that, for example, project to the nucleus accumbens, then we have a way of figuring more specific treatments for all of these diseases. Today, I want to talk with you specifically about the projection from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens. And I want to show you that even within the single projection, there is a lot of diversity in dopaminergic anatomy and in dopaminergic function. 
So how do we study this? What you see here is a coronal brain section. In the upper part, you see the projection target of the dopamine cells. That's where dopamine is released. And in the lower part, you see the ventrotegmental area. That's where the dopamine cell bodies are located. And what we did is we injected a retrograd tracer into this target area in the nucleus accumbens, and specifically in the lateral part of the nucleus accumbens. This tracer is retrogradly transported and accumulates in the cell body. So based on the presence of this tracer, we can selectively identify the projection target of the cell. In the same animals, we injected another retrograd tracer, let's call it FG, into the median nucleus accumbens. And this is similarly retrogradly transported. And here's what we saw. What you see here in red, the cells that are labeled in red, and they overlap with the dopamine cells, these cells project to the lateral nucleus accumbens. The cells that are labeled in white, these cells project to the median nucleus accumbens. And what you can see immediately just looking on this picture is that these cells are located in two different anatomically separated subregions of the VTA. On the right side, you see a higher magnification. You see how specifically we can identify the cells based on the presence of the beads, in this case, the retrograde tracer. However, what is really exciting for me, and these experiments have been ex performed in mice, that when we perform the same experiment in rats, in another species, we see this, again, this very similar clear anatomical separation between the cells that project to different brain regions. They are completely independent from each other and in different subregions of the VTA, suggesting that these cells may involve in different behavioral function. And if we figure out a way of targeting selectively, we may have a more specific treatment for many diseases that involve the neurotransmitter, the chemical messenger substance, dopamine. So in order to study their specific function, what we use is a novel technology. This technology is called fiber photometry. With this technology, we can specifically measure dopamine release in the brain, in a living animal that is performing a behavioral task. So what we do here, and I won't go into detail here, but we use different viruses and optical fibers to specifically measure dopamine release here in the medial nucleus accumbens and in, nucle in the lateral nucleus accumbens, simultaneously in the same animal while the animal is performing a behavioral task. And the behavioral task is very simple. So we have our mouse here, and then we present what we call a conditioned stimulus, a CS+. This can be, for example, a tone or a light pulse, and this conditioned stimuli indicates that after a certain time, a reward will be delivered to the animals. For example, a sucrose solution, as mice love the sucrose solution. So imagine, I want to give you an example out of your real time. You're very hungry, you drive on the freeway, you see a sign, for example, for In-N-Out Burger, given that you like In-N-Out Burger. So what you do, you see the sign, and then you say, oh, this is two miles to the next In-N-Out Burger. So this sign, In-N-Out Burger, is your CS+, plus, the condition stimuli. And then the next thing you do, you take an executive action. You drive over to the next exit, you leave your car, you order your burger, the reward is delivered. Nothing else is happening here in an animal. But the difference, during this time, we measure your dopamine releases in these two different regions. We make the task a little bit more complicated because we also want to measure the motivated, the execution of the animals in order to get the reward. And we do this by changing the, the, the random interval, we introduce a random interval, which means the condition stimuli is, is turned on with a specific time, and this can be randomly selected between zero and 2,500 milliseconds, yeah? By, by, by introducing this random interval, the animal never knows when the actual reward is delivered, and what it does is continuously licking. It is working for the reward. So it shows some executive action. And you can see this really here in the graph, that if we have a very short interval, as indicated here on the top, the reward in red is when the reward is delivered and the animal licks the reward and then it consumes it. The longer the random interval is, 
you see the more the animal shows actually reward-seeking behavior. It continuously licks for the reward. Consistent with your action driving on the freeway, figuring out the next, the shortest way to get to the burger. And then, now let's look in the dopamine levels in these two subregions. First, I show you the level in the lateral nucleus accumbens. And what you can see here is each individual color indicates a different random interval. So first we have this, this a very short random interval. But what you see immediately, what you may appreciate, is that there are only two signals. One is when the animal sees the cue, the light turns on, you see the burger signal. And one, another one, when the reward is delivered, when you eat your burger. It only varies by the duration of the random interval. So the longer the animal has to work for it, dopamine levels goes down, the animal becomes depressed because it takes longer to receive the reward. And now I show you the dopamine levels recorded in the same animal at the same time. And what you see, it, it looks fundamentally differently. So what you see here, it ramps up shortly and why the animal is seeking the reward, basically. We don't see this biphasic signal. So this signal in the medial nucleus accumbens is fundamentally different. We think, what we think is that this signal is important for execution of action, for their motivated behavior while the signal in the lateral nucleus accumbens is more of a computational signal, a signal about learning about the reward. So what I have shown you today in summary is that dopamine nerve cells, they are not a homogeneous population. They are very diverse. They are located in different regions, even within the same anatomically defined subregion. They project to different brain regions, and release in a specific brain region is associated to their specific function. If we figure out a new way of how we can target these cells selectively, we might have a more specific way for, de for developing neuropsychotic treatment for many different neuropsychotic disorders. And with this, I would like to thank specifically the One Mind Foundation for supporting my research. And I particularly want to thank the members of my lab, and particularly Han de Jong, who has performed a lot of experiments which I just have shown you. With this, I would like to thank also you very much for your, uh, for your uh, interest in my talk. Thank you very much.